high end maybe. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so I resume. Um, George Silberschatz is a professor in uh, San Francisco and a director of research of um, a very prolific uh, research uh, team over the years, a very influential figure in psychotherapy research. He's one of the few, I would say, who has from very the very start of psychotherapy research uh, in in you know decades ago. Um, worked used, worked with case formulation methodologies, uh, no, being mindful that um, when we compare the effectiveness of psycho different forms of psychotherapies, that there is something that may get lost. That is the understanding of the individual patient, and also the uh, you know understanding interventions as they fit to the individual patient. So today, there's no surprise, we will be hearing George Silberschatz uh, speaking about tailoring psychotherapy to the patient. Um, he will be using a, a specific theoretical framework from psychodynamic psychotherapy, that is a control mastery theory, to illustrate his, uh, his message. It's a huge honor to have you here, George, this evening. I'll uh, hand it over to you after this brief introduction. It's your turn. Thank you so much, Yuli. The, the honor is really all mine. I really appreciate uh, being here with, uh, with all of you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay. So thank you. This is, um, this is the title of my talk, Tailoring Psychotherapy to the Patient in, in Clinical Work and in Psychotherapy. And I'm just going to review very quickly some of the main points that I want to cover so that you can just follow where I'm going with all this. First of all, I want to focus on the role of adverse experiences in psychopathology. We're going to talk a little bit about psychopathology because, in my opinion, it's hard to talk about psychotherapy without having at least some framework for psychopathology. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to show how people who experience traumas internalize them as beliefs or narratives or schemas or internal working models, whatever you want to call them, which are on a continuum from adaptogenic, they can be adaptive, to pathogenic. And I'm going to show you a case formulation method based on control mastery theory that provides a reliable framework for inferring pathogenic beliefs or schemas and a model about how therapists can best help their patients. And I want to say at the outset that control map the, the framework that I'll be talking about is a contextualized model. In other words, it does not privilege any particular techniques. What it emphasizes is supporting the patient's efforts to disconfirm their maladaptive pathogenic schemas. So that's what I hope to cover today. So I want to just share with you some very basic assumptions, just so you know where I'm coming from, that guide my perspective in today's talks. So first, the critical importance of early experiences. In other words, the childhood experiences shape personality. Secondly, the patient's agentic qualities. The patients have agentic qualities. In other words, they make decisions, they carry out plans, they can do this consciously, and they can do it unconsciously. Next is the centrality of adaptation. You're going to see that, from my point of view, adaptation is central and that it's hardwired in all of us by evolution. And related to adaptation, we make conscious and unconscious appraisals because making appraisals is a highly adaptive mechanism for assessing safety and danger. And finally, as you'll see when I talk about that context is critically important, both in understanding psychopathology and in understanding psychotherapy. So before we go any further, I just want you to think about this very brief clinical vignette and think about how you might respond to it. The patient in this vignette is a 30-year-old woman who sought psychoanalysis because she fights with her husband. Now, it's interesting because she loves her husband and she's seeking treatment to understand why does she fight with him 
And why can't she enjoy a sexual relationship with him? Her therapist is a Freudian analyst, and she knows that he is very interested in dreams. So this is the vignette I want you to think about. This is about the fifth session of the therapy. The patient says, I had an interesting dream last night. And there's a pause. I also had an upsetting fight with my husband. And now there's a long pause. And she says, which would you like me to talk about? So I want you to think about this vignette. Think about how you might respond to this as a therapist. In other words, try to think about what your response would be now before my talk. And then I want you to think about how you might respond after my talk. Okay? So we'll come back to this later. So I want to start with adverse experiences, which is the, the adverse, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs study. Many of you are familiar with this. I'm going to go over it very quickly, but I think it's a really interesting and important piece of research about psychopathology. Because this was done by a man named Folletti, who's not a mental health person. He's, a, he's the director of preventive health, medical health. And he was interested in why do so many people do things that are not healthy for, the, for, their, for their physical health? And he studied a very large sample, not mental health patients, but patients in a medical setting, 9,500 adults. And he developed a simple measure about what kinds of things do they report happened to them earlier in their life. Things like psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence, and so on. These are just simple questions that he asked in a survey. And the results of this study are really interesting because when you compare those with four or more of these uh, adverse childhood experience versus patients that had none of these experiences, what you find is there were four to 12 times the rate of alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and attempted suicides, and two to four times the rate of smoking, poor self-reported health, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and so on. So having these adverse experiences played a very large role in subsequent uh, psychopathology. And this just shows uh, some of it here with the use of um, illicit injected drugs that people took. So people that had none of these adverse experiences were very, very low in injected drugs. And you can see here, people that had four or more of these experiences had a very, a very high percentage of them used street drugs, injected drugs, and so on. The overall conclusion from this study is that adverse experiences are vastly more common, recognized or acknowledged, and they're powerfully correlated to adult health a century, a half century later. So the, the, to quote the, their conclusion, the ACE study reveals a powerful relation between our emotional experiences as children and our adult emotional health, physical health, and major causes of mortality. So there, there are many things in the literature that I could point to and review with you about the role of early experiences in psychopathology. I'm just focusing on this one study because it's very powerful. But as clinicians, we know that when we work with patients, people often talk about adverse, difficult experiences they had in childhood and so on. Of course, there are longitudinal studies about this and so on. I'm going to give, I want us to all be on the same page about this. So I want to give you a little bit of an experience of what it's, what an advert, we all know what adverse experiences look like. And I don't need to tell my colleagues in Ukraine about adverse experiences in current reality. But I want you to look at this simple experiment done by Tronic called the still face experiment. And I'm going to play this for you just to give us all a feel about some of this. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my computer. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby 
is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay, so I, I show you, this is a very brief clip, and you could see, I think, in the first even two or three seconds when the mother has this still face, how the baby reacts in a, in a like, almost shocked kind of way. And the, the reason I show that this is just like a 45-second a, a period of a mother being de neglectful, if you will, in quotes, of, of the baby. But I want you to imagine what it would be like and what the experience is like for someone who grows up with, with in a household like this and the impact that that would have on their own views of themselves and so on. So how does psychopathology develop? So I would say people experience adverse or traumatic experiences, for example, parental neglect, like in this brief vignette that I showed you, they develop internal working models. This is what Bowlby called it, i.e. beliefs to make sense of the experiences. In other words, my parents neglected me because I was bad. This is what children do. And I'll put up here a quote. This is from the Dr. Man, just months ago, from a woman named Dr. Becky Kennedy. She's a quite a popular a psychologist who works with children and parents. And I, I really like this. In, in a one paragraph summary, this is a, a really good flavor of what I'm talking about. So this is what, uh, this was in an interview in the New Yorker magazine. Kennedy says, our kids are oriented by attachment. How they get their safety and security is through their attachment with us. We give them food, shelter, all the things they need to survive. And so they're always paying attention to the status of our relationship with them. In a moment when we yell, instead of them feeling safe and secure with us, all of a sudden, the person who gives them safety and love and security becomes a person who's delivering fear. If we don't repair, a kid has to find another way to get back to feeling safe again. They have to tell themselves a story to get back to that secure place. And the story kids generally tell themselves is that it was their fault. They think, I'm a bad kid, I'm bad inside, I'm unlovable, I make bad things happen. Because then at least they can still believe that their caregiver and really, the world around them is safe and good, which is something they need to preserve their own survival. So this is a very succinct summary of what happens to kids in an adverse experiences. And what, what she's implying is there's something adaptive in that moment for the child to blame themselves instead of blaming them, their parents. Because by blaming themselves, they can still hold on to a view that there's someone good in the world that they can rely on. So it just gives you another flavor about the role that adverse experiences can have in children. So let's talk a little bit about trauma. And again, I feel a, a little awkward talking to our Ukrainian colleagues about trauma. But um, so trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience in which a person's emotional and coping strategies are overwhelmed. 
So there are two kinds of traumas that people talk about in the literature. There are shock traumas, which are powerful, single incidents, accidents, serious illnesses, war, death of a loved one, and so on. And stress trauma, ongoing repetitive experiences that a person grows up with, such as growing up in an alcoholic family, of emotional neglect, chronic abuse, and so on. Those are two kinds of traumas that people talk about. So what I want to emphasize here, that the concept of subjectivity in trauma, in other words, it's the subjective experience of constituting the trauma. Two, two siblings from the same dysfunctional family who experience identical adverse parenting, one may be traumatized while the other is left unscathed. So subjectivity is very important here. And what accounts for the difference? What, why is that? And I think for me, it's, it's the concept of a schema, that there's a, a structured pattern of thinking, feeling, or behaving that organizes how we perceive and experience the world. So I don't mean schema therapy. A lot of times when I say schema, people immediately think, oh, you mean Jeff Young and schema therapy? No, no, no. The, the concept of, of schema, <clears throat> excuse me, is very old. <clears throat> Piaget wrote about it, of course. Bartlett wrote about it. And of course, even Immanuel Kant uh, wrote about it in the 1700s. So the American Psychological Association describes um, schema as a cognitive structure used for comprehension, perception, and interpretation of stimuli. That's what a schema is. And the schema helps us to understand and make sense of what it is that we see and experience. So the relationship between trauma and psychopathology is often thought of like this, that there's a trauma and it leads to psychopathology. And this more subjective view of trauma would suggest that, no, there's, there's a trauma that's mediated by the particular schemas that people develop, and it's that that leads to potentially to psychopathology. So people experience events differently at this point. That's really what I'm trying to say. Okay, let's turn now to psychotherapy. Um, how does therapy work? Well, the first thing I want to say to you is that, and I think this point should be emphasized more. I think we do, a, as psychotherapy researchers, we could do a better job in our public relationship, in our public relations, because the first thing I want to point out is that therapy, just in aggregate, forget about different kinds and all that, but in general, therapy works. So the, an average untreated person who has difficulties is going to be much, much worse off than the average patient who does get therapy. Okay, so it's important to keep that in mind. So what kinds of studies have been done to assess why therapy works? Well, there are many studies of techniques and brands. There are studies about the relationship, so-called nonspecific factors. And finally, there are studies about the therapist and therapist effects. For brands, um, one of the early studies um, was the Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Program done by the National Institute of Mental Health, which basically compared, brand, the, the, the NIMH was interested in the question in treating depression, which treatment is best? I mean, it was a question, this was done in, 19, in the 1980s. So they compared cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, imipramine, which was the drug of choice at that time, and placebo. And a, I, I mean, I, I show you the results here, but I want you to keep in mind that a lot of time and effort and money went into planning this study. People invested very, very heavily in designing this study, and it was methodologically considered state-of-the-art. But what was the outcome? This is the percentage of patients improved over here, and this is what we found. There were no differences between any of these four conditions, a rather striking finding, and people didn't like, I mean, of course, and everyone complained after, no, the study wasn't good, this wasn't right, that wasn't right, the cognitive behavior therapists were particularly upset about it, but these were the findings. Now, I start with this early finding, but um, 
things have not changed very much. So the in, in 2012, the American Psychological Association did a review of all the psychotherapy research, and they and this was their conclusion. Comparison of different forms of psychotherapy most often result in relatively non-significant difference, and most valid and structured psychotherapies are roughly equivalent in effectiveness. And Bruce Wampold and uh, his take a step further uh, in a book called The Great Psychotherapy Debate. And this is a slide from one of his recent publications. If you look at specific ingredients here, which are techniques or the adherence to a treatment protocol here, or even rated competence, and you look at what is the effect size in terms of uh, how much outcome is accounted by these things, it's very low. Specific techniques is practically zero. But what's high? Goal consensus, the, the, the patient and the therapist collaborating on what the goals they're working on and so on accounts for an enormous percent of variance. So in other words, despite the overwhelming evidence that therapy brands or techniques don't explain outcome, what is the gold standard in psychotherapy research? And the gold, whoops, the gold standard is basically this, randomized controlled trials, horse race studies, trying to see which one is best comparing brands and techniques. And yet we know from what Wampol told about uh, meta-analyses that brands and techniques don't really account for much variance. So what I wanna, draw our attention to next is what might the research look like if clinical thinking was incorporated into the research? In other words, if we thought more like clinicians, we wouldn't be doing these horse race studies. Uh, most clinicians don't really think that's a very good way to go. But what would the research look like if we were trying to think about things more clinically? And I'll give you a hint. The psychotherapy research would look very, very different. So the first thing we'd have to come to terms with is that the homogeneity assumption is a myth in psychotherapy. So in most psychotherapy studies, in these horse race studies, randomized trials, you get a very large group of patients. They're thought to be homogeneous. I submit to you they are not. They get randomly assigned to treatment groups. There's follow-up, and then you compare the results. But the homogeneity is a myth because patients are not homogeneous. They experience events differently, even if they share the same diagnosis. Therapists are not homogeneous. They're very different. And treatments, even when they are manualized, are not homogeneous. So if you think about individualized approaches, this is from uh, the education research. I really like this quote from Ignacio Estrada. If a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. And I think that begins to get closer to the way uh, a lot of clinicians think. This is a very old concept I'm talking about here. So this, this is thousands of years old. This comes from Buddhism. It's a symbol... I mean, I live in California, so we see this symbol all over the place of a, what they call a bodhisattva. This is a particular one called the bodhisattva of skillful means. And I always wondered, why does this thing have so many arms? And the reason in, in Buddhism is that what they're trying to convey here is that in order to teach Buddhism, you have to tailor it to different people that these arms all contain different things. Some of them contain a knife, some of them contain scissors, some of them contain, contain kindness and so on. So this is an old concept from Buddhism about the way things are taught has to be tailored to the person that you're teaching, thousands of years old. Hippocrates said it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. Thomas Aquinas, the theologian, is what said, what is received is received in the manner of the receiver. 
And then more recently in cognitive science, in cognitive neuroscience, you have this man, Anil Seth, a very well-known uh, cognitive neuroscientist who says, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. So all of these things point to the subjectivity that I'm speaking to here. So applying this kind of personalized to, approach to psychotherapy, what would that look like? Well, instead of tailoring the patient to the treatment, which is what we do implicitly in these horse race studies, we should be tailoring the treatment to the patient. So clinical, clinical wisdom shows us that responsiveness, that is the therapist reacting in a manner that is appropriate or right for that particular pe person is a predictor of therapeutic effectiveness. So in psychotherapy, responsiveness refers to the therapist's capacity to tailor and modulate therapeutic processes and interventions to patients' specific problems, needs, goals, and sensitivities. But how, the critical question is, how can the therapist know what is responsive for that particular patient. So there, there are two, there, there's a whole field that I learned about just a few years ago called relationship science. It's not a clinical field. It just looks at what happens in dyadic communication. When any two people are communicating, what is going on in that process? So they talk about two dimensions of response. And I'm thinking here particularly of the work of a man named Harry Reese. So he talks about two dimensions of responsiveness. There's intended actor responsiveness, and then there's the perceived partner responsiveness. So a therapist, for example, can have can intend to be responsive to their patient, but it's what the patient perceives that is particularly important. And Reese would say it's the only thing that's important. In other words, that the partner perceived responsive is the primary that matters. And that goes back to the what Aquinas said, that what is received is received in the manner of the receiver. It's the only way that things are received is by who's receiving it. So the question, how can a therapist develop a better understanding of what a patient will perceive as responsive? That's the critical question. It's a critical question clinically for us as clinicians, but I would maintain it's also a critical question for psychotherapy research. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about control mastery theory because it helps us understand patients' experiences and how they shape, how the patient's experiences shape their perceptions. And that this understanding serves as a guide for responsiveness. So first of all, what is control mastery theory and what, what it isn't? So control mastery theory is a model, it's a framework for how psychopathology develops and how psychotherapy works. It is not, and I really wanna emphasize this so we're very clear about this, I'm not talking here about a new brand of therapy and moreover, it doesn't privilege particular techniques at all. What it emphasizes and what it does privilege is the importance of therapists being responsive to the patient's problems, needs, and goals, what I'll talk to you about as the patient's plan. So the, this theory started with a very interesting observation that Joe Weiss made in a very short paper um, published in 1952. And the, the question that, that Weiss took up is why do we cry at the happy ending of a movie? People can go to a movie and during the sad parts, they may be quite, you know, just following things, but not particularly emotional. And then when the happy ending comes, they cry. And the question he asked is why? Why would people cry at the happy ending? And the answer he gave was that the happy ending makes it safe to experience the grief and sadness that they felt during the saddest part of the movie. It's about safety and perceptions of safety and the way a person regulates their affects 
based on their perceptions of safety and danger. So this paper was the cornerstone. The paper was called Crying at the Happy Ending. It was the cornerstone for the development of control mastery theory, and it led to many important insights in clinical applications. For example, why do we have pleasant dreams during periods of extreme stress and frightening dreams when the stress has passed? Again, it's the, the concept of safety and the way people regulate what they do based on their perceptions of safety and danger. And similarly, um, what are the conditions that allow our patients to lift defenses and bring up painful feelings? Again, people are regulating and appraising what is safe and what is dangerous. So these are the basic building blocks uh, of, of the theory. In other words, with these six elements, you have the theory in total. First comes adaptation. I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more in a moment. Attachment and the perceptions of safety and danger that are rooted in attachment. The role of trauma and adverse experiences. The kinds of beliefs or schemas that people can develop from those adverse experiences. The kind of appraisal, vigilance, and testing that people uh, are always doing based on their beliefs. And then finally, the kinds of corrective experiences that people can have that allow them to overcome some of those pathogenic uh, beliefs. So these are the basic building blocks of the theory. So let's begin with the what, what I call the adaptive imperative. And this is basic Darwinian biology. It really begins with Darwin and the fact that we all living things, not just humans, but all living things are hardwired by evolution to adapt. In other words, you either adapt or you die. And so evolution wires us to adapt to our environment and to our reality. So adaptation is the foundation. It's the, it's the cornerstone of control mastery theory. Everything rests fundamentally on this concept of adaptation. So let me just give you a few basics about uh, human adaptation. In human, the key to adaptation are attachment to caregivers. We can't survive without our caregivers. Um, in, in ecology studies, people say there's no such thing as a lone monkey in the environment. A lone monkey is a dead monkey. So attachment to our caregivers is critical for adaptation and forming a conception of reality uh, in, in adaptation in those early experiences, we form a conception of reality and those are our beliefs or what I call our schemas. So a reliable model of reality, if we're going to survive and adapt, has to be guided by learning about what is safe and what is dangerous. And we constantly appraise, again, this is adaptive, we have to appraise people and situations in, in an effort to assess safety and danger. So appraisal is, quit, is critical for that process. And finally, the, the, the primary forum for developing our conceptions of safety and danger are our relationships with parents or caregivers. So if you think back to that quote I read you from Dr. Becky, that's what she was talking about. And this isn't to say that people cannot develop psychopathology based on experiences with siblings or friends or that kind of thing. No, I mean, all of those things happen. But our relationships with our parents and our caregivers are critical in this. And then finally, there are adaptogenic versus pathogenic models of safety and danger. So one thing we have to be clear about is <laughs> what was once adaptive can become pathogenic. And what is currently pathogenic was once adaptive. And I think you could get that from the, the quote I read you earlier from Dr. Becky, which really comes from a famous psychoanalyst named Fairbairn, who said that it is better to be a sinner in a world ruled by God 
than to live in a world ruled by the devil. So in other words, for a child, it is adaptive for that child to see themselves or to blame themselves for the way they're being treated, because then at least they can hold on to the hope that the world is a good place. Whereas if they, if the child were to feel like, no, I'm, I'm good and my caregiver is bad, that would be a very, very difficult environment to grow up in. So that's why I say what was once adaptive can become pathogenic. And I think when you look at what's currently pathogenic, you can often find the roots of what was one, how it was once adaptive. So in the control mastery framework, this is the basic model of psychopathology. It's relatively simple. People have adverse experiences of all kinds, often with parents or caregivers, but it can be with siblings, with peers, and so on. It's adverse experiences when they de can develop pathogenic schemas or Bowlby's concept of internal working models. And the schema, when I talk about a schema or a pathogenic belief, I'm not just talking about simple beliefs. It, it's a constellation of behaviors, relationships, emotions, and so on. So examples of, of pathogenic schemas, you know, someone who is treated uh, badly in childhood sees themselves as ugly, worthless, a failure. Uh, they see in the, their view of the world is that no one loves me, no one ever will love me. I'm hopeless because things will always be this way. This is a, a particular kind of uh, depressogenic schema that you see a lot in very depressed patients. So we can think about core organizing uh, pathogenic kind of schemas that develop in childhood and persist for a lifetime. Um, I'll just give you, I'm going to go through this quickly, like uh, this patient, Linda, who was an unwanted child. Both parents wished they'd never had her. They regretted not having an abortion. This is what she grew up with. And so her pathogenic scheme, of course, is she believes that she is unlovable. Or another patient who was a particularly precocious, very, very intelligent child, and his father reacted very poorly to his probing questions about the way things worked, and the father would get very upset about it. And so this patient believed that he had to hide his intelligence in order to avoid hurting people that he loved and needed. So the building blocks of control mastery theory, I've quickly covered these first four about adaptation, safety and danger, trauma and pathogenic beliefs. I wanna talk a little bit about vigilance, appraisal and then corrective experiences. So the, what's the theory of therapy? First, patients come to therapy in order to disconfirm their pathogenic beliefs and master their problems. So sometimes when I talk about this, particularly in psychoanalytic audiences, they say, wait, you mean to say that you think patients come to get better? And, and I say, yes, that is my belief. Uh, that isn't to say it's easy. Uh, and there can be many things that get in the way of that. But the theory uh, infers that that is a fundamental motivation in people coming to therapy. So people come to get better and have a plan for doing so. And their plan is, is essentially, in, in its simplest form, the plan is just to disconfirm their pathogenic beliefs. Now, those patients suffer from these pathogenic schema. I'm lovable, I'm unlovable, or you know, I'm a bad person, and so on. And they want to, they come to therapy because they don't want to have these kinds of views of themselves. And so this is basically what you can think of as the mastery motive in control mastery theory, that people want to disconfirm their pathogenic belief. But when I say that, of course, I realize that it's not easy. So I keep that in mind as well. So how do patients work to disconfirm their, their pathogenic beliefs? Well, first, I mean, the one thing that's very familiar in a lot of therapies is, well, they could develop greater understanding. In other words, the role of insight. Uh, that is one way that people, people can learn something new about themselves, and that can help them to begin to disconfirm those views. People can also test their pathogenic 
beliefs and schemas. They can test them in the relationship with the therapist. They can test them in other relationships in the hope that to see that they are not borne out. And finally, people can have corrective relational experiences or what Alexander called corrective emotional experiences. And again, that this could happen in the therapy, but as I've been rereading Alexander lately, he often pointed out, he made a big point of saying that these don't just happen in therapy. The therapy is designed to prepare the patient to have more corrective experiences outside of the therapy relationship. So these are just different ways that patients can work to disconfirm pathogenic schemas. So I told you we think about a, a plan, and I want to just give you a, a flavor of what we think of as a plan formulation. This is just a way of organizing, if you will, the patient's narrative, or what is the patient's inner world. Um, it, it's a way of putting that together in a way that uh, we have found helpful. First, we want to think about what are the patient's adaptive goals. In other words, people come to therapy, they have all kinds of goals. Some of them may be maladaptive, but people do have adaptive goals, and these can be conscious as well as unconscious. And then next, what gets in the way? If people have adaptive goals, say to have a better relationship or to feel better about themselves, what gets in the way of that? And of course, that's the pathogenic schemas that I've been talking about. And then where do these pathogenic schemas come from? As I've already given a sense, they come from adverse experiences that people have had. How do people work to overcome these uh, pathogenic schemas? They can test them in the therapy and outside of the therapy. And then finally, they, there are what kinds of new experiences or insights or corrective, so-called corrective experiences will help the patient to disconfirm their pathogenic schema. So th there's nothing uh, magical about that. I mean, in a way, this has a particular logic to it. You know, you start with what does the patient want? What's getting in the way of the patient achieving that? Where do those things that get in the way come from? And how does the patient go to work to overcome those things? That's the essence of what we mean by a plan formulation, just to demystify it a little bit. Okay, so a few very brief uh, examples uh, of plans and plan formulations. An abused child, the child who was abused, has a plan to disconfirm the pathogenic belief that she deserved abuse. Okay, and again, think back to that uh, interview I read to you with um, Dr. Becky, and I think you can see that in there. Um, a, a patient, Myra, wanted to leave a poor relationship she was in with an alcoholic. All a man, she disconfirmed the pathogenic belief that she would ruin him if she left him. And that pathogenic belief came from a, a feeling and a worry she had when she was growing up about leaving her depressed mother. So this is someone who grew up with someone that she felt she had to take care of. If she's in a relationship that's pretty dysfunctional, but she has a hard time leaving because she's afraid, she's worried about ruining him. Okay, I think that gives you enough of a flavor of it. So this, in a in a nutshell, here is the is the conceptual model, if you will, of, of this is the whole thing. Now I showed you the one of psychopathology. This is now the whole the whole package. So adverse tra traumatic childhood experiences, for example, a depressed parent, illness, emotional neglect, dysfunctional family, all kinds of traumas, can lead to pathogenic beliefs or schemas, internal working models. The patient comes to therapy. They're motivated to disconfirm these. They want to change those internal working models. And then the hypothesis is that the, the degree to which therapist interventions help patients to disconfirm those their pathogenic schemas is what leads to positive outcomes. Uh, whereas interventions that confirm pathogenic beliefs lead to poor outcomes. So this begins to give you a different way of thinking about what accounts for the effectiveness of psychotherapy. And I'll show you a little bit of research in a moment that speaks to that. 
All right, so the control mastery theory is a very case-specific model. It's a personalized model. The context of the individual patient's traumas, pathogenic beliefs, need, and needs is central to the theory. So in other words, context matters. Context is everything. And therapy techniques, this is a very important point, that can be helpful or harmful, can be helpful or harmful, depending entirely on context. An intervention that's helpful to one patient can be harmful to another patient. So you can't look at techniques, in my opinion, in a decontextualized way. The only way that thinking about techniques is useful is in a contextualized way. So a few brief examples of this. In, in CBT, in cognitive behavior therapy, we think about homework and the value of, of homework in cognitive behavior therapy. I'm not opposed to homework, but consider a patient who comes to therapy, to a CBT therapy, who's always been very driven, always had to be perfect, always had to be the best. And she, in the first few meetings, she does her homework and it's the best homework and she's really... And then one day after a couple of months of therapy, the therapist asks about her homework and she says, I didn't do my homework this week. For that patient, that's an achievement. It's not a problem that she doesn't do her homework. It's a huge achievement that she could just relax and not be so driven about doing homework and always being the best. In other words, this is a beautiful paper written by a colleague of mine, Endangered by Interpretation. So there are, I mean, in, in psychoanalytic thinking, we think interpretations are everything. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the key to successful uh, therapy. But Cynthia Shulkrit wrote this paper that, no, there are patients who are actually endangered by interpretation. So she was focusing on narcissistically vulnerable patients. And the narcissistic vulnerable patient can't stand the idea that someone else is thought of something that they themselves have not thought of. And when the therapist makes interpretations to some of these patients, they feel belittled. They feel less than, and, and it makes them feel worse. So again, you have to look at these things contextually. You can't look at them. You can't look at something like interpretation or homework or self-disclosure or any intervention in a decontextualized way. Okay, so a couple of uh, clinical vignettes to sort of just flush out what I'm trying to get at here. Um, I want to, this will illustrate why, why context, in case you haven't gotten it so far, this will make it very clear about why context is so important. So here's a young, this is an actual case, a young woman sought psychotherapy because she felt, quote, excessively self-contained. She always had to rely on herself and she wanted to be able to rely more on friends and loved ones for help. That's what she was coming to therapy for. She reports growing up as an only child in a very dysfunctional family. She recalled asking her parents for help or advice when she was a very young child, and they responded angrily, and they would say things to her, we don't know what to do. Why don't you go figure it out for yourself? So you can imagine a young child getting answers like this from a, a parent and what that would do to them. So she diligently engages in therapy and begins one session by saying, I'm really not sure what to talk about today, and I would like to get some guidance from you. Do you have any suggestions for me? Now, how to respond? You know, what do you say as a therapist, keeping in mind the context of what I told you about this patient? So a case formulation is a way of personalizing, it's a way of contextualizing therapist interventions. So remember I showed you these elements of a plan formulation, the goals, the schemas that interfere with goals, traumas, and how the patient works. So let's develop just really quickly a very rudimentary plan formulation for this particular patient, just based on what I've told you. Her goal, we know what it is, it's to be less self-contained. 
and to be able to rely more on others. That's what she wants. That, that's what she wants help with. What's getting in the way? She had these adverse experiences of neglectful parents who couldn't provide developmentally appropriate help and guidance, leaving her entirely on her own. What's the pathogenic belief? What's the internal working model if you grow up in a family like that? It's very obvious. I, I can't rely on others for help. I'm on my own. So can I rely on you? Now she's in therapy, right? And in asking for some guidance or help, what she's really asking for here is, can I rely on you, the therapist, for help and guidance? So remember when I talked about appraisal and testing? This patient now is trying to find out can he, here I'm in a relationship with someone. They've been working for a, a couple of months together, and now she doesn't know what to talk about, and she's asking for help and guidance. Can I rely on you for that help and guidance in a way that I could never rely on my parents or others in my life? Begins to suggest a way of responding, right? So what's the helpful intervention? Well, Let's look at what the therapist did. The therapist was a non-directive kind of therapist. She adhered to a very non-directive stance, and the therapist says, what would you like to talk about? Now, remember when I showed you about uh, actor intended responsiveness and partner perceived responsiveness, right? So this is intended by this therapist as a helpful thing. This is the way she's trained. We do things non-directively. We ask the patients what they want. It's very, very well intended on her part. But how is this patient going to perceive it? Based on her experiences, how is she going to perceive a question like, what would you like to talk about? So the therapist's intervention reflects a top-down. It's technique-driven. It's a totally decontextualized approach. You should always be non-directive, right? It fails to take into account the context of this particular patient <clears throat> and what she previously shared about her childhood traumas. The more helpful intervention for this patient, just for this particular patient because of this context, would be to provide guidance, which the patient would likely experience as a corrective emotional experience and passing a very important test. So in other words, by the therapist saying, providing some guidance of what to say, this patient, again, this is not, this doesn't hold across the board, but this patient would experience that as a corrective emotional experience. Okay, now I wanna go back to the little vignette that I gave you at the beginning. So this was a 30 year old woman who sought psychoanalysis because she fights with her husband. She loves her husband. She'd like to understand why she fights with him. So she sought out a, a tr treatment with a Freudian analyst. And in the first few sessions, she described the pattern of fighting with her husband, her inability to enjoy sex, and gave a detailed history of her family of origin. She grew up with an extremely narcissistic father and a mother who obliged him, just went along with everything he wanted. And the family ethos was you have to go along to get along. That's what it takes to uh, maintain harmony in the family. So this is the fifth or sixth session and the patient starts out, this is the vignette I showed you early. The patient starts out, I had an interesting dream last night. I also had an upsetting fight with my husband. And there's a long pause. Which would you like me to talk about? So just think about the narcissistic father for a moment, but let's just use what we've learned about this patient. And we'll, again, we'll develop a very quick, very rudimentary plan formulation. What's her goal? She wants to improve her relationship with her husband. That's what she's coming to therapy for. What are her adverse experiences? She has very narcissistic father. She had to do everything he wanted in order to get along with him. The pathogenic belief, the internal working model that she developed is 
in order to preserve my relationship with my father and more generally with a man or people, I need to subjugate myself. I need to do what they want, not what I want. That's the way you preserve relationships. So she's asking the therapist. Now, this is, remember, I talked about appraisal, about safety and danger. And she's trying to find out in this therapy or very early on, will I need to subjugate myself here with you the way I had to with my father? That's what this is fundamentally about. Which would you like me to talk about? And obviously, a helpful intervention, again, for this patient, now given this context, is which would you like to talk about? That would be a corrective experience for this patient, because now, oh, now I have an experience with someone who's more interested in what I want than what they want. So when I say context matters, I mean that the identical intervention, what would you like to talk about, is extremely detrimental in the first case and extremely helpful in the second case. So something as simple as what would you like to talk about? And we should talk about, um, I think we should talk about what you want to talk about versus helping the patient and giving her guidance. It really, the same thing is helpful in one patient and detrimental in the other. And this is just a way of putting in clinical form the kind of thing that uh, Wampol was showing in this slide. The particular technique is not going to get you very far in explaining what's effective, but something about the degree to which there's some consensus between the patient, in my language, the degree to which there's some compatibility in the way the patient is working in the plan formulation accounts for a great deal of outcome variance. So the very powerful effect size of, of goal consensus really supports the view that the therapist's ability to understand and facilitate the patient's goals is the strongest predictor of outcome. And our research group has done studies, so far I've just focused your attention on, on why this is important clinically, but now I wanna show you how you can apply the same thinking in research because our group has done studies using case formulations and we found very strong correlations between therapist interventions that are responsive to the patient's goals and therapy outcome. And I'm just gonna very quickly show you some of that and then we will have some time for questions and discussion. So a few, just some background and findings from our, our research group process studies. Therapist interventions that are responsive to the patient's therapy goals, what we think of as the patient's plan, are predictive of in-session progress. Another, and sessions with a higher frequency of these kinds of interventions are significantly more productive than sessions with fewer interventions. So this is what it looks like in a, in a single case. Um, this graph here is what the degree to which the therapist is disconfirming pathogenic schemas. And then this is the patient's functioning, in this particular case, the, the patient experiencing scale. So you can see that as the therapist is moving up in this dimension that is um, disconfirming pathogenic beliefs, the patient functioning goes up. And when the therapist functioning, when the therapist degree of, uh, in other words, when the therapist is confirming pathogenic beliefs, doing poorly on it, the patient's functioning goes down. And that goes across, this is session by session, um, this is the same thing in a different case, showing you the same kind of pattern. And this would be it with three individual cases. And you can see the correlations of these things are actually quite high. But what all of this research entails is developing a formulation of the particular case, just like I showed you in the clinical examples, and then using the formulation to guide um, the ratings of the therapist's interventions. So what I do there, uh, 
findings. I also want to draw your attention to outcome findings because it's it's obviously useful to show that some of these things help explain what happens during the therapy. But the question is, what does it do in terms of predicting outcome? And I'm going to go through this very quickly. But um, you know, this study was based on 39 patients, uh, 16 experienced therapists, and um, Patients were screened by a clinical uh, evaluator before the treatment, and the patient, the therapist, and the clinical evaluator filled out a variety of forms before and after therapy. Um, so the therapist interventions were rated in this outcome study by uh, a brief summary of the intake interview and the plan formulation. That was the basis for making ratings of therapist interventions. And then we selected uh, sessions, four sessions from different phases of the therapy, an early session, early middle, late middle, and late session. And what judges rated using the plan formulation was just therapist comments from the session. No patient material was uh, included. And all these judges did this independently. They rated the plan compatibility of the therapist interventions for the session as a whole. So in other words, what people are rating here for the session as a whole is to what degree did the therapist disconfirm the patient's pathogenic schema? And that was done on a seven-point scale. And all of this was done with high degrees of reliability. So we look at outcome in, in several different ways. You know, there's symptomatic changes, what we call individualized changes and global changes. And these were the correlations. So you can see with symptom changes, the more the therapist disconfirmed pathogenic beliefs, the less symptomatic the patient was. And the same is true for uh, global changes, individualized changes. And then this is an interesting part of the study. We asked patients at the end of the therapy about their experience of the therapy. Uh, how freely were they able to talk to the therapist? How well did they feel the therapist understood them and so on? And you can see here that at the, the degree of plan compatibility of the, uh, of the therapist's ratings predicted, and it was highly correlated with what the patient experienced at the end of therapy. So these were very high correlations. They explain a great deal of variance, both in outcome and in the patient's experience of the treatment. I want to show you one more thing before we have some discussion about this, which is the role of therapist effects. So the question is, can, we know that there that some therapists are more effective than others. These have been called super shrinks in some forms. Um, some therapists are clearly more effective. And these therapist effects actually trump brand. So in a clinical trial, if you're comparing CBT and some other form of treatment, the therapist effect is more powerful than the treatment effect. Um, and if we wanted to optimize psychotherapy outcomes, it would be useful to understand what are these super shrinks doing that their less effective counterparts are not doing? In other words, what accounts for their effectiveness? And just to give you a flavor of how powerful these therapist effects are, there are this isn't just clinical uh, clinic data from many, many therapists, many, many patients. The difference between the most effective therapist and the least effective therapist is a factor of 10. In other words, the most effective therapists are 10 times more effective than the least effective therapist. So it's a big effect. I mean, this and this happens in almost all studies that I'm aware of, that therapist effects are powerful. So there's no question that some therapists are more effective. They have consistently better outcomes than others, but little is known about how these so-called super shrinks achieve their superior result. That's to me, that's the most interesting question, right? What in the hell are they doing that the less effective ones are not? So the hypothesis we were interested in studying was that their inter the super shrinks interventions tend to be more plan compatible than those of their less effective counterparts. So this is just a hypothetical. If, if all therapists were equal in terms of their effectiveness, this is what it would look like. If outcome 
were on a, a z-score, you know, on a standard score with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one in the positive direction and minus one in the negative, everybody would be here. That's by definition if there were no therapist effects. But it doesn't work that way. And here's some real data. This was just a study that we carried out in our research group. This is the, uh, just to explain this a little bit, there were 16 therapists in this and what's rated um, down here are their mean outcome scores for their whole caseload, not a particular patient, but the therapist had caseloads. And what we're looking at here are their outcome scores for the caseload as a whole. So what you see here is that there are therapists, clearly I put them in green, who are more effective. In other words, they're above the mean of zero. And there are clearly therapists who are less effective. Their, their mean, the mean for their caseload, in other words, all of the patients they see is below zero. So there's a big difference between these two. And what accounts for their difference is that all of these therapists up here had some training in case formulation. All of these therapists um, had some, did what I showed you in the two uh, clinical examples that I gave. They took context into account and they used that context in terms of their intervention. For those of you who are more statistically inclined, this is a very, very big uh, statistical difference between the most effective and the least effective um, therapist. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions and discussion. I thank you for your attention. I've thrown a lot at you, and uh, this is a good time for questions, comments, feedback, or anything you'd like to bring up. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, George. This has been very inspiring, uh, listening to every word attentively. So let's turn to the group. You can also write in Ukrainian, and maybe somebody could translate if you prefer writing or speaking. And then we in the English channel, George, you should be able to hear the translation directly. Any comments, George, in your experience? I take that to mean that it's so clear that uh, one can't even question what I said, <laughs> but that's, that's not true. So don't, don't be shy. It was very clear, too. Doesn't include any questions, so Please go ahead. Any questions you may have? People say thank you. And I don't know what thank you is in Ukrainian, but it may be what's been said here. Um, okay. Yes, yes. Well, there are lots of thank yous. I simply want to say that I really was fascinated by this talk by George. Really, it was so condensedly clear was extraordinary, in my opinion. I enjoyed it very, very much. I don't have a question right now, but I will think about it. But uh, I simply want to congratulate with George. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, it's, you know, to me, it's one of the great ironies. Uh, I've really struggled with this for a long time. Psychotherapy, if you think about, I mean, whatever your point of view, whatever uh, brand of therapy you follow, should be the most, psychotherapy is the most personal thing there is. Right. I mean, we, we hear things in our work with patients that they often don't tell anyone else. It's a very personal experience. And yet so little of the research and, and it, it, it takes that into account in terms of context. It's like a complete irony to me. And I think I think Nancy McWilliams once talked about this, that a strange thing happened to psychotherapy when we got absorbed in, in randomized trials. Because in a way, maybe we needed this. She was talking about psychodynamic therapy, but maybe in a way we, we needed 
randomized trials to show that something that we're doing is working. Okay, you know, that's that's fine. But she said, that, I, may, I may be misquoting her, but basically she said, but look at the price that we have paid for that. Because the price that we have paid is we think of, well, we, we have a treatment for these disorders. You know, that these disorders need this treatment or these disorders need that treatment. And we completely lose sight of who the patient is that's being treated. And I just find that very, very ironic. Yeah. I was very much struck by what you said, something that all, I always thought myself, that many analysts don't ask themselves how the patient perceive what they say. Exactly. So very, very often. They simply have a standard technique and they yeah. apply it and they don't understand. They never ask themselves how the patient can understand what they say. You know, exactly. I think it's incredible. Still today, the many analysts do that. Yeah. And it's not just analysts. I mean, there, there are a lot of top-down, that's why I just use that non-directive kind of, but CBT, I mean, people in, in it, it's part of the branding of psychotherapy that's happened that people feel they have to just adhere to this brand. If you're an emotion-focused therapist, you must just focus on emotion, forget everything else. But yeah, I think it's it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, George, there is a question from one of the participants in the, in the chat from Alexandra Kovalenko. And the question is, can we correct the length of session according to the client and according to the context? For instance, if a client needs more time to feel relief, can we have longer sessions? Mm. I mean, I would say yes, that, that we, we should, uh, I believe that we should do what, whatever is helpful uh, to the to the patient and if patients need more I mean the difficulty would I mean most of what I do is open-ended therapy I have to confess that's what I do but we also have to take into account the realities that of course not I mean you you can't do open-ended therapy for for everyone uh, and there are there are many of us that work in settings where you have where you're constrained by how much you can do with a patient or how long you can work with a patient. And I think that's just a reality that we have to we have to find ways of, of dealing with. But I I favor doing whatever whatever helps a patient is what I'm in favor of. I think it's the, you know, when I when I talked about that relationship science work by Harry Reese, he studied um physician, medical doctors and, and patients. And the only thing that accounted for health outcomes was how the patient perceived their doctor. And so I, I take the, the concept of the patient's perception as I really give that a tremendous amount of weight. And so in, in anything, I mean, I think for some patients, if you... Um, you know, if you share something about yourself, it means a great deal to them. It means that you, you know, they may feel that you you care about, whereas, you know, for other patients who, who have very narcissistic, it may not be particularly helpful. But I think the, the, key, the key point for me is what's going to be helpful for this particular patient? And do I have a framework, at least for thinking about that? That's what I think is so critical. Another question, uh, Ms. Irena Lihus. Uh, 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 there is a question, uh, and I cannot translate it because the guy is talking, sorry. The idea that you don't have to give experiences, but simply understanding the patient. And to give corrective experiences is something that is not good, is not psychoanalytic. Many people feel the same way today still, unfortunately, you know, because of the Alexander that was in a way excommunicated by the psychoanalytic church many years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Can I suggest to go back to Nastasia? Uh, there is a question. I think, yes. yes, there Please, is a question. Ahead. Thank go you. Ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. question from Irena Lihus. She's asking, what sources would you recommend to uh, be in the loop of all uh, new researchers to understand what's going on in the field? 
I'm sorry, I missed the first part. What would I, what you sources? Asked? What sources? What books? Uh, oh, what your, courses? Your, uh -huh. sources, not courses, sources like books, maybe or magazines or whatever it was. Mm. Um. So I. There are there are publications, and I could uh, maybe send them to to Yuli or Michal after uh, that. I could you know send some. I didn't prepare a uh, a reference list, but I could I could send some papers, uh, which you could uh, download. I mean, make them totally available for uh, for free from our website. Uh, that would uh, further amplify uh, some of what I was talking about and, and give more details about uh, just how we do some of this research. But I think um, I think the, the, the Bruce Wampold work is very, uh, I mean, Wampold's work is to me very interesting because it shows the difficulty in, um, in the way research is done. He doesn't give very good solutions <laughs> of how to do it better. He's a very good critic of the research. He doesn't really, uh, give good alternatives, and if I were to uh, give you guys some papers to consider, I would uh, I would want to give some that give you uh, good alternatives. But some of the work, you know, that Yuli Yuli Kramer has done work in this regard. Uh, Franz Krasbar and Klaus Grave from Switzerland were were very very far ahead of the curve in psychotherapy for taking into account. They also have a concept of, of the patient's plan is a little bit different when I talked about, but they they have a way of doing these things in a case specific way that is very very helpful, and I think some of um, it didn't go very far, but some of Lester Luborski's early work on the core conflictual relationship theme, you know, what's interesting to me is that this. This kind of thinking, that's why I showed you the Buddha slide. And, and so it's been around, or Aquinas, you know, it's been around for so long. And it's just been so hard for people to really grab hold of it. Because doing research in this way, as Yuli can tell you, and certainly as I can tell you, is very, very hard. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. And uh, I think it's worth it because we find findings that are interesting and, and relevant to clinicians. But I think it's just been, I remember when, when I was starting to read Lester Laborski's work and I, I tried to look at where did his idea, he studied things like the symptom context method. It was very interesting work about when a symptom develops in the course of a therapy, like, and the symptom he focused on for, in one example was momentary forgetting. Let's say the patient's talking and they say, I forgot what I was going to say. He could identify that, you know, hold it and, and look at what was the context for that, which I always found very interesting. But then when I, I dug into it about where did I, how did he get that idea? And I looked further back and it was um, Margaret Brenman and Merton Gill, when they were at Menninger at the time, <laughs> did a study called Spontaneous Fluctuations in Hypnosis. They were doing uh, hypnosis with people as part of research, and they would be very interested in, there were moments when the patient would say, I'm going deeper now. And they were interested, what happened? What, why? What, what accounted? And so that's the kind of research that has always intrigued me. It's, it's about context and giving tremendous weight to the context of what comes up and why it's coming up. speak George to your first uh, proposal uh, you can definitely send uh, resources or references and I'm happy to we're happy to forward them to the group uh, after the webinar great there's one that's a very short paper I sent it to Michal I think and to some about um, and in a way my whole talk is really from this very very short paper it's a commentary on um on, on the meta-analysis about interpretations and outcome. And the question I posed in this commentary is why do interpretations account
for so little variance in outcome? That was the question. I, and I, and my answer, I did it in a very, very short, you know, it's not like two or three pages long, but in a way, the, the essence of my whole talk today is basically contained in that very short paper. So I'll, I'll send that to you. One more question from yes. Natalia Zubovic. Thank you for amazing lecture. You mentioned works of your colleague Sylvia, don't remember her second name, concerning interventions with narcissistic clients. Could you please send us reference to this work as well? Oh, yeah, I'd be very happy to. It's a wonderful paper. Endangered by interpretations. And it's uh, oh, there's a, beautiful, a really beautiful paper about um, why interpretations can actually be uh, harmful to some people. The thing that she emphasizes in that paper, which is something I didn't really get into here, but um, it's a concept called treatment by attitude, that there are many, many uh, uh, psychotherapies where being able, where, where the, the attitude of the therapist is what accounts for the movement in the therapy. It's not what the therapist says or does, but it's, it's having a particular attitude that is in itself therapeutic. And she talks about that in that paper. And um, uh, there's another um, study that uh, Marshall Bush did about um, psychoanalysts' own experiences of their own treatments and what they found helpful. And again, it was not the particular interventions or anything. it was more about how the, whether the, their therapist helped them in terms of um, accomplishing their goals and help them feel um, supported. It was a big part of the findings from that study, so. Anastasia, do we have more questions or is it time to wrap up? No, Uli, no more questions, everything else is thank you for interesting lecture, thank you for the amazing lecture, thank you for great information and so on and so forth. So okay. lots of uh, thank you. Lots of gratitude. Okay, so let me also, George, express my warmest gratitude to you on behalf of this SPR for Ukraine initiative. Uh, you have shared your wisdom and your thoughts. It's been well received by many and all of us. Um, thank you for, for your time. And I turn it over to Michal for some final words and outlook. Sure, let me just say, I thank you. I appreciate I appreciate the comments. But I also want to say how... Um, really privileged I feel. I was very, uh, very touched by your invitation to present to our Ukrainian colleagues. And I feel very privileged to be able to, to talk with you today. So thank all of you. Thank you also, George, for this wonderful lecture and very inspiring. Uh, I always, when I listen to you, I always think about also my patients and clinical background and today a thought came to my mind that we as uh, psychotherapists uh, and also as societies create contexts in which also the patient meets with us so perhaps this attitude is also the context we create with the patient mm -hmm. uh, this is just an initial thought from today so thank you very much for also in this inspiration um, and and there were many questions considering where to hear more from you uh, and uh, one source uh, that uh, you all can use are SPR conferences and uh, we have actually several coming uh, soon. One will be in Ottawa, it will be in June this year, then in Brno, Brno in Czech, Czech Republic, so quite close, uh, in September this year and then next year in Krakow in Poland. Uh, so, uh, actually, two major events quite close to Ukraine. So, do please come, feel invited, and uh, we encourage you to join uh, us there. 
Uh, and also, we have already plans for the next webinar within the SPR for Ukraine initiative. It will be on the 29th of May, 29th of May. So uh, the title will be the responsive psychotherapist, how therapists from different approaches attune to their clients in the moment. So very interesting talk by Jane Watson and Hadas Wiseman. Jane Watson is from Toronto, uh, from the University of Toronto, and uh, Hadas Wiseman is from the University of Haifa in Israel. So we invite you all to join us for the next uh, webinar at uh, on 29th of May. Uh, and I will put it in chat so you can really have all the information. There you may copy it, it will be easier for you. And I'm sure that you will be able to hear more from George in several of the occasions that I've mentioned. Thank you. Take care of everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.